Uh, good evening, everyone. So um, I'd like to talk now about uh, life after stroke rehabilitation, some practical advice and some research uh, that we've been doing here in RCSI with Anne and David and in the School of Physiotherapy. So I suppose the first thing is, you know, there are about 10,000 strokes in Ireland every year. That's one every hour. And as David mentioned, 30,000 people are living with disability after stroke. And I suppose even though the thrombolysis, the clot busting treatment is available and the thrombectomy, the clot retrieval, some patients will still need rehabilitation uh, because everybody, I suppose, is no two stroke patients are the same and everybody has a different experience and the stroke affects them differently. So if we, if we look at how, I suppose, here, here we see in the schematic, we see on the left side, uh, well, on your left as you're looking at the slide, we see the left side of the brain in the head has been damaged, and we see the problems on the right side of the body. So we get this crossing over. So after stroke, we can have a number of difficulties. There can be weakness in the arm, the leg, the arm and the leg, the trunk, the muscles around the abdomen that control balance and help us to stand up straight, our vision, our speech, swallowing, as Anne mentioned, cognitive problems, mood, depression. Some people have problems with continence, the bladder and bowel control as well. And then for some people, a very small number, they can have problems with pain also, which can be very distressing. So stroke rehabilitation is very important. And the goal of rehabilitation essentially is to relearn those skills that somebody loses after they've had a stroke. So this rehabilitation starts very early on. So we've, we've spoken about the stroke units and luckily now we're very fortunate that we've gone from a position back in the early 2000s when we only had one stroke unit in Ireland to now nearly having 27 hospitals who have a stroke <coughs> unit. And the stroke unit, as David mentioned, when he looked at all the different advancements in stroke care, they reduce disability, they reduce length of stay, and they reduce the likelihood of death after stroke. So the stroke unit is a very specialised area in the hospital where a team of expert doctors, nurses and therapists are all working together. And what happens in the stroke unit is once the person is stabilised after their stroke and they get all their medical management, rehabilitation starts very early. So we see here in the slides that rehabilitation starts in the first 24 hours. And often the focus in that 24 hours is being seen by a physiotherapist to look at your positioning and check um, the breathing control so that there aren't any chest problems and also checking the swallow because a lot of people have problems um, after their stroke with their swallow. So it's very important that they can swallow safely. So often in the emergency department the nurse might do a bedside swallow screening test if they're trained before the speech therapist comes along and does a, a very detailed examination of the swallow. Because again, it's very important um, that somebody, um, that they're safe eating and drinking so that they don't get what we call an aspiration pneumonia, that the food, rather than going into their esophagus, down into their stomach, it goes into their lungs instead and they can be very unwell as a result of this. So a wide range of people are involved in rehabilitation and we call this team the multidisciplinary team. So you'll see here that that includes the doctors, the nurses and all the therapists. So the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, the speech and language therapist. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of hospitals have a clinical psychologist, as Anne mentioned. Less than 2% of people are seeing a psychologist after their stroke. The dietitian is very important, the social worker. And the orthoptist is somebody who can check visual problems. And again, not everybody gets to have their visual problems screened after their stroke. And sometimes they're only detected a little while after. And this is obviously very important for driving and maybe for getting back to work as well. When somebody leaves hospital, their general practitioner is involved in their care. And the person who's had the stroke and their family are at the center of all this rehabilitation. So what does physiotherapy do? Many patients see the physiotherapist. This, re this physiotherapy treatment starts very early on. We're trying to look at the, the deficits after the stroke, how it's affected the movement in the arm, the leg, the posture, the balance, the walking, how we can help somebody to relearn those skills, practice those skills, coming down to the physiotherapy department. The occupational therapist could be involved as well. So again, occupational therapy focuses on our activities of daily living. So washing, dressing, feeding, our personal care, um, maybe using adaptive cutlery, um, learning how to dress again, doing this practice on the ward, basic skills like brushing our teeth. In lots of the occupational therapy departments, there will be a kitchen area where somebody can practice um, managing everything in the kitchen, making a cup of tea, and then maybe the transition to home. When somebody's getting ready to go home, they will go out to the home setting and do the home visit and see what needs to happen in the home environment. Maybe looking at steps, rails, 
um, decluttering the environment if somebody's at risk of having a fall after their stroke. And again, all these team members are working very closely together and communicating every week at what we call the MDT team meeting to discuss the patient's progress and make plans and plan for discharge. Now, Anne mentioned the speech and language therapy problems after stroke. Um, and again, a lot of people, they have difficulty um, with, with, I suppose, with understanding speech and also communicating, so um, I suppose uh, producing speech. And this can be very distressing for people and for their families also. And then we also see the swallow problems that the speech and language therapist will look at. And I suppose a, a very serious speech problem after stroke is aphasia. But the speech and language therapy problems can also overlap into reading, writing, managing numbers. And sometimes people have difficulty maybe over the phone, writing down a phone number, for example. So, this, so, so it's very important to have this conversation with the speech and language therapist so we can find strategies around all these difficulties. And this is a slide that I've taken from uh, the Aphasia Handbook that is produced by Connect. Connect is an organisation in the United Kingdom with a specific focus on communication difficulty after stroke. And we see here in the slide some tips for somebody who might have communication difficulty and also for health professionals how we can facilitate communication after stroke. So taking it slowly, maybe having a pen and paper, pointing, having little images, taking your time, confirming that there's good understanding, that we understanding, we're understanding each other and maybe nodding. And a lot of us, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, doctors, nurses, we can learn all these skills from the speech and language therapist. And it's important that families have access to this information as well so they can facilitate communication for the person when they go home. So ultimately, I mean, rehabilitation, it's intensive in hospital. When we look at the length of stay in the most recent stroke audit, it has come down to about 20 to 30 days in hospital. Now, this obviously is going to vary for different people after their stroke and how severe their stroke is and, and the different situation that they're in. But ultimately, we're planning for discharge. So we're, we want to have a successful transition where the person is going to be able to go home into their home environment and continue their rehabilitation in the community. So there's a lot of planning and preparation involved planning the goals, looking at the progress, setting a discharge date, having a meeting with the family, the different therapists, deciding what rehabilitation needs to continue after discharge. So more physiotherapy, more occupational therapy, more speech and language therapy. Where will that occur? Some hospitals have a day hospital, the patient can come in on a daily basis. For many, it's the community team in the, re in, in the, the rehabilitation team in the community. So again, it's very important that the families involved in this process, that they have information, that they're prepared, um, and there are lots of informal sources as well where, where, where I suppose there's extra information available. So the work of the Irish Heart Foundation and the stroke support groups and the volunteer stroke schemes as well can offer a lot of support in the period after somebody goes home and when they're transitioning and adapting and coping with life after stroke. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about early supported discharge because this is a treatment uh, whereby the evidence is very strong. Unfortunately, it's not widely available in Ireland. We have three hospitals that offer early supported discharge at the moment, and they are Tala Hospital, the Matter Hospital, and the University Hospital in Galway. So the aim of early supported discharge is to help the person after the stroke to get home sooner and continue that rehabilitation in their own home. So here we see the typical picture. We see the acute period, somebody's coming into hospital to get their medical treatment, their clot busting treatment, their clot retrieval treatment, they're starting their rehabilitation. And then we see that ultimately we're planning for discharge and that person's going to continue their rehabilitation in home. So that's where we see the blue section here on the slide and the support. So what happens in early supported discharge is we can see that that rehabilitation part that happened between admission and discharge is now shortened. So the person starts their rehabilitation in hospital, but they're going to continue that specialist rehabilitation at home. And that is because of the availability of early supported discharge. So I suppose to be very clear, early supported discharge is not early discharge, it's early supported discharge. And that support is in the form of a rehabilitation team that is available to deliver the rehabilitation rather than in the gym and the departments in the hospital in the person's home. So this makes a big difference to the rehabilitation because it's a very meaningful environment for the person who's had a stroke and for their family. Now, it's not suitable for everybody. There are different criteria that have to be met before somebody is considered suitable for this type of treatment. But it does mean that the rehabilitation is very meaningful. It's in the person's environment, in their sitting room, their kitchen, their bedroom, the stairs, all the different issues that sometimes 
I suppose when you're in the hospital environment, the environment is, is very different to the way your, your home environment is. So it makes it more meaningful, it's more motivating. Patients are a lot happier, they do very well with early supported discharge. Now, I suppose in general rehabilitation, Anne spoke about the difficulties that, patient, that people after stroke have with attention and concentration. And when somebody has a stroke, it comes out of the blue, it's a shock, they mightn't understand what exactly has happened, they're trying to come to terms with it, it's an anxious time, a worrying time. Uh, they're going through a lot of different treatments, a lot of different people coming to talk to them. They may find it difficult to concentrate, to take in all the different um, pieces of information that, that the health professionals are sharing with them. So this has an impact on rehabilitation as well because as I said rehabilitation is about learning learning new skills and often after the stroke somebody might be eating very well sleeping very well so again it's going to affect their participation so I suppose we have to start off with little doses of rehabilitation and try and build that up so that the engagement and the tolerance of the rehabilitation increases and improves because we do know from the research that the more practice we do the better the skills are going to be. And we certainly know from all the stroke guidelines internationally that patients should get at least 45 minutes of treatment from each of their therapists. So for example, if they need physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and speech and language therapy, they should be getting 45 minutes of treatment from each of those therapists in the hospital. And the guidelines say ideally seven days a week. Now we don't have that in Ireland. Some countries have been piloting looking at seven days a week. Now again, sometimes it's important to take a little break as well at the weekend and be maybe re-energized for your rehabilitation on a Monday morning. So again, you know, we, I suppose this, this is something that has to be looked at. But I suppose we do know from a recent stroke rehabilitation audit where we looked at 26 units in Ireland, only six of those units were able to deliver 45 minutes of therapy to their patients. So I suppose we've made a lot of progress, but we still have some more progress to make. And I suppose a lot of this comes back to resources and putting the research into practice and talking to the politicians and the policy makers. So progress is slow, but it is happening. Um, now, so I suppose the next question is, when should therapy stop? And as I mentioned, everybody is very different after their stroke. So we talk about the physical part of recovery, but there's also the psychological part of recovery. And often I suppose there's a big focus on the physical part in the hospital and immediately when you go home. And then around the six month mark, the other issues, the psychological part of stroke starts to kick in. And that's where it is very difficult to access a psychologist, either in the community or in the hospital. And people might get very anxious about their recovery. And also, it's probably a time when the rehabilitation that they were getting in the community is starting to taper off and to reduce. But again, when we look at the guidelines, they're telling us that we should be giving intensive treatment for people up to six months if they need it. Um, now, it's less conclusive up to one year and after one year, but certainly in the guidelines, it's recommending that there should be regular reviews for patients. And I suppose the experience in the Irish setting is that this, this isn't always happening and it's a resource issue um, with all the different services. We'd like to be able to do these things, but the resources are, are still very limited in rehabilitation and more progress needs to happen here. Now, I suppose in terms of looking at the different challenges after stroke, it can be walking difficulty, somebody might have a mobility aid, balance and falls could be a concern as well. We don't quite understand why we don't get the same degree of recovery in the upper limb, but for many people, the recovery in the upper limb is poor and they don't regain the same degree of activity and movement in the upper limb as they did before the stroke. There are other issues like fatigue that Anne mentioned as well and the loss of confidence. So again, the key messages are to keep active. We know from the research on sedentary behaviour that it is negative for our health. So it's important to spend less time sitting, less time lying down, more time on our feet moving around, even if it's only a little bit of activity to try and progress that. It's also important to, com to, to become a community ambulator, so to mobilise out maybe with family and friends and to build confidence and to keep active. Now we have done some research on falls after stroke here and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that um, in a few minutes. But again, it's very important to listen to the advice when, when, we're going when you're going home after stroke because many people are at risk of having a stroke, but it's important that they don't restrict their activity, that they're careful, that they plan the activities and that they learn to get up after a fall. For many people, if the arm is very weak after the stroke, it may be very tight. We have um, 
a problem in the muscles that we call spasticity. So it can cause an abnormal posture in the limb. It can mean that the limb feels very stiff and very tight. Uh, the circulate, if the movement isn't occurring in the hand, it may mean that the circulation is poor and the hand feels cold. So again, keeping the limb warm, elevating the limb, supporting the limb, maybe using a support that the physiotherapist has recommended to support the weight of the limb. Um, with regard to fatigue, it's very important to set realistic goals. So maybe planning the day, deciding on the activities and, and setting achievable goals and realistic goals and maybe using a diary as well is very helpful and balancing all the different activities throughout the day to manage the fatigue. I suppose loss of confidence. Many people that I've spoken to when we, when we go to visit the stroke support groups, they often feel that they're isolated after stroke, that maybe family and friends and neighbours aren't calling as much. And maybe it's because they don't understand what a stroke is and how it's affected the person. So it's very important to use the support of family and friends and neighbours and the support groups and the work of the volunteer stroke scheme um, groups and the stroke support groups as well. Because again, sharing information and, and, and tips at those meetings is very valuable. This is just a slide to illustrate how inactive people are after their stroke. So we see in the third box here, we see the people who are nearly reaching 9,000 steps a day. And then on the left, in the first two boxes, we see the stroke survivors who are really only not even reaching 3,000 steps a day. And we know from the research that all of us should be doing 10,000 steps a day. Now, I have met some stroke survivors in some of the stroke support groups, and they wear the little pedometer. And, and they're building up their activity and they are increasing the number of steps that they're doing or, or even maybe using a little app on the phone. So again, they, these can help us to actually become more aware of how active or inactive um, somebody is after their stroke. Because again, it's important to keep active and stay active and to take more exercise. And certainly it may be something that somebody has done before the stroke. Maybe they enjoyed swimming, walking, gardening. We do know in some areas, like down in Cork, that, they, um, that there's a lot of activity happening in gyms where stroke survivors are able to go into the gym and have a very personalised programme and they're making great progress. Um, certainly, if, if you're um, s s swimming, it's possible to talk maybe to the, the pool attendant. I've, I've, I've heard some of the members of the stroke support groups talking about how they can adapt, how they get into the pool, perhaps if they have difficulty with the steps. So they can look at different solutions for getting back to the activities that, that someone enjoyed before they had their stroke. And again, it's very important to take the advice of the health professional. So if anybody is concerned about taking up exercise or increasing their activity after stroke, talk to the health professionals, talk to their GP, talk to their stroke doctor and their physiotherapist so that the exercise programme can be progressed and tailored to that person's needs. Driving after stroke, again, for a long time we didn't have guidelines in Ireland about driving after stroke and now we do. And um, this work was done by the, the Royal College of Physicians and Professor Des O'Neill, who is a consultant stroke physician in Tala Hospital. So again, the guidelines, very important to talk to the doctor about if, if you've had a mini stroke, the TIA, or a stroke about safety after stroke and getting back to driving. So recovery is, I mean, the brain is very plastic. We talk about neuroplasticity and the capacity of the brain to change, but everybody is very different. And we do know from the research, and a lot of this research is very old, going back into the 1950s, that a lot of this capacity to change and adapt and respond to rehabilitation happens in the first month after stroke. And we do know that the length of stay is about a month now in the Irish hospitals for many stroke survivors. But a lot of the recovery can continue up to six months, and some of the studies have even shown us that it can continue up to one year or five years. Now, we do come across a term called plateau, and this can be when the recovery slows down. And this is like anything. It's like learning a new skill. We need to take a little break. Um, so it's important to recognize this as well, and that the stroke survivor doesn't push themselves too much. So maybe we're learning a lot of new information. We're going to put that into practice, and then we're going to take a little break, and then maybe we'll come back to rehabilitation again. I suppose our services aren't structured here in Ireland, whereby we can have that break and then start rehabilitation again, because a lot of our rehabilitation is structured in that it's provided straight after hospital and then it tapers off and then it can be very difficult for the stroke survivor and their family to access rehabilitation after that. So I just wanted to talk to you about some research that we've done here in RCSI with the Irish Heart Foundation. This study is about life after stroke. So we spoke to people um, who were a year up to five years after their stroke. And I suppose we see the same message coming across here. So these were the stroke related problems that people were still experiencing up to uh, five years after their stroke. So we see mobility is the highest, followed by fatigue, the emotional problems, concentration, problems with the arm, memory <coughs> falling.
okay? Speech, writing, pain, visual, reading, bladder and bowel problems and swallow. So we see a whole range of issues here. Now, in the next slide, this is looking at the unmet need. So again, people felt that they needed more help with their emotional problems and fatigue after stroke, because these issues can be very frustrating and it's very difficult to access um, specialist um, advice for these um, areas. We also found that people, um, I suppose, paid for a lot of their treatment as well and paid for adaptations to be made in their home. And certainly this is common and we found this as well in some of the other research that we've done. And also they needed help with activities around the home and with their own care. And a lot of this help was provided by their own family members. So their relationships were affected. The stroke had a personal, a social and a financial impact and this is very important because um, we've also done some research on return to work after stroke and we see that a lot of people, it takes a while to get back to work after stroke for some individuals so therefore we see an increase in expenses and we see a decrease in income and this can be very stressful for families and for the person who's had a stroke. Okay, so this was work that we also did on return to work after stroke. So we, we spoke to people, asked them about the different factors that limited them or maybe you know, adversely affected them going back to work. And we see that the key things here were fatigue, so mental and physical fatigue. So it was almost like the, the hidden part of stroke that wasn't really visible to everybody else at work or uh, to, to friends and family. Just the overwhelming fatigue that people felt, um, which was a significant barrier for them getting back to work. And we also see some other practical things that would have been necessary um, for them to transition back to work. So they're thinking, they're walking, maybe they need to go upstairs, their arm, using a computer, talking over the phone, um, visual spatial problems, being aware of their environment, emotional difficulties and maybe writing as well. So again, we see some gaps here in the supports that are available for people going back to work. So a lot of them were able to access physiotherapy, but if we look over to the far right of the slide, we see services maybe like occupational health, the specialist vocational rehabilitation in Dunleary, community liaison officers, the disability officer. There was little information about how to access these services and how they worked and how they could help the individual. So nearly 8 out of 10 people we surveyed had worked before their stroke, 6 out of 10 got back to work after their stroke. It, could have t it, it took about 6 months to 12 months for them to get back to work. Uh, there was a significant impact on their income, their income dropping because they weren't at work and these are the challenges that they met, so their fatigue and memory, speech and physical problems. And the things that helped them most were engagement with their employer. So again, that flexibility, maybe a phased return to work, that understanding among work colleagues as well um, to be able to help them to get back to work. We've also done some work here in the School of Physiotherapy on falls after stroke and Mary, Dr. Mary Walsh, who got her PhD um, a few weeks ago, did this study over three years. We, uh, David spoke about um, the population changes in Ireland, how the proportion of those who are older is increasing. We, there's been a lot of research done on falls in, in, in the elderly population, less so falls after stroke. And when we looked at the little bit of research that were there, we see that stroke survivors are twice as likely to fall. So this study focused on following stroke survivors in the five main Dublin teaching hospitals to see were they actually falling and how often they were falling. So four out of ten were falling and a lot of those people were likely to fall again. We also looked at, I suppose, the pre-stroke self and the post-stroke self. So Anne spoke about you know, how, how somebody feels different after the stroke and this is something that's often relayed to us when we visit the stroke support clubs and we speak to the stroke survivors about how they feel after their stroke. Um, and again, this had an impact on how they managed um, after their fall. But the key messages about how they coped with falls were, first of all, avoiding falls, learning how to get up after a fall, being careful. But getting back up again was a key theme. So again, being very proactive and problem solving. And I suppose this is a, a new trend in, in rehabilitation and healthcare as well, self-management and being proactive. Um, I mean, there's been a, there are going to be more advances in research and in rehabilitation for stroke. Um, in this slide here, I've just captured robotics. Again, there have been some studies done in Europe looking at robotics, whereby the arm is supported in a robotic device and it allows extra practice for the arm. And as I mentioned earlier, all that practice leads to um, 
better skills. So we need more opportunities to practice and lots of opportunities to practice outside the designated rehabilitation times. And family can get involved in this. There's been a lovely FAME study, family mediated exercise done by Rose Galvin in the University of Limerick as part of her PhD, looking at how family members can facilitate rehabilitation and help with rehabilitation as well. The we, I suppose the we isn't seen as commonly now, but certainly has been used for balance rehabilitation after stroke. Um, the third image there is treadmill training. So this is where the patient is supported in a harness that's suspended from the ceiling over uh, a treadmill. So this allows them to practice the rhythmic movement of walking. So again, uh, a few centres in Ireland have treadmill training. The equipment is very expensive. The evidence is, is still weak, so needs to get stronger before that, that type of treatment would be more widely available. We know as well from some other very novel research that music therapy, art therapy, um, is, is, is very beneficial for stroke survivors as well. And certainly there's been a, been a big emergence in apps. So the use of apps for information, for monitoring um, your physical activity after stroke, for setting goals after stroke. So, so it's a very exciting time for rehabilitation. I suppose this slide, um, Anne spoke about the stroke audit and I was involved in the first stroke audit and I've been involved in working with the Irish Heart Foundation since 1997. So at that time we did, our first uh, report was in 2000, it was called Towards Excellence in Stroke Care, we had no stroke units. We had one stroke unit when we did the first stroke audit and here in this infogram you'll see that we went from 1 to 21 stroke units um, when, we did, when, we repeat, when the audit was repeated in 2015. So you'll see in this graph we're looking at stroke units, we're looking at people, how many people are getting into the stroke units, so all these things are improving. The number of people who are getting the clot busting drug, that is increasing. Um, the staffing levels are improving but they still need to um, increase a little bit more. The number of people who are having their swallow screened, this is increasing as well. The time that people are spending hospital is coming down, so people are getting home sooner. The number of people going to nursing homes is also reducing. Um, but just on the right of the slide there, I've just put up um, a cover of the most recent um, audit of the rehabilitation unit. So this is the first time we've started to look at rehabilitation. And I suppose there still is some work to be done here, because when we look at that particular criteria of people getting 45 minutes of treatment, um, six of the 26 units that were surveyed in that study um, told us that they were able to offer 45 minutes of treatment to their patients. So again, early supported discharge is very positive. The teams who are delivering early supported discharge, the patients love it, it's working very well, the results are very good. So again, we need to lobby for more early supported discharge and that is happening. There have been business cases developed and sent to the HSE, but progress is, is slow, but we need to keep pushing um, pushing the, um, I suppose, the agenda for early supported discharge. Also, we're capturing a lot of information, stroke register data, so a lot of the hospitals capture information on stroke, and again, this is very important, as Anne mentioned, to have numbers, to have statistics, to, to look at the improvements, to, de to have the evidence to demonstrate that it is working, it makes a difference, it co it's cost effective. So, um, uh, Helena is going to be talking about um, the Irish Heart Foundation, but these are some, this is a link to the Irish Society of Chartered Physiotherapy, but again, the Irish Heart Foundation, um, their website, www.stroke.ie, looks at all the different rehabilitation professionals and has a list of all the professional bodies, um, you know, so that, so that people can contact them to get more advice about, st about stroke. So thank you very much.